This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 67 for January 22nd, 2010. Hey everybody, it's Vincent Racaniello. Friday afternoon, pretty nice weather here in New York, and it's time to talk about viruses. And joining me today from Western Massachusetts is Alan Dove. Yes, indeed. How's life in Western MA? Oh, it's okay. Um, the weather's the weather's okay, and uh, you know the election nonsense has died down. So yeah, well, we can't talk about politics. No, here. we can't we, talk about politics. We've been <laughs> we've been uh, reprimanded for doing that's that, right. So we'll stick to the viruses. Also, really happy to have us join join us again. For his second time on TWIV, Mark Pelletier. Hey, it's a real honor. Thank you very much. Ah, honor for us. Great to have you. Marcus of the Futures in Biotech podcast at twit.tv slash FIB. Great podcast. If you don't listen to it, you must. Well, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of our listeners do, but if they don't, they should be because it's great science. I just listened to the uh, MRI podcast on my on my car the other day unbelievable griswold is great he's such a good ex explainer i mean he broke it down i had no idea that that is how an mri worked nuclear spin <laughs> unbelievable all your nuclei and, and getting them to spin a certain way with a huge magnet did you know that alan yeah well you know why they don't call it nmr right why is that because of the word nuclear <laughs> <laughs> I, I am dead serious. I'm dead serious. It ex is it is exa exactly the same physical phenomenon and a lot of the same yeah. hardware as, a, as an NMR. Um, but when they took it into the clinic, they said, no, we can't call anything nuclear. Uh, they'll scare people, basically, scare right? People. So even though it's electromagnetic. So here was my question, uh, Mark. If NMR is limited to small proteins, solving the structures of small proteins, why can't we do whole viruses with an MRI? I don't think the resolution is there yet. Too small, yet. huh? Yet. <laughs> that, that. Yeah, the, the, voxels, the voxels on MRI are much, much too big to see viruses. Okay. So NMR is greater resolution, but you're limited to smaller things. Right. It's great stuff. Anyway, Alan, you should uh, check it out. It's really cool. Yeah. The, the amount of power, the size of the magnet, it's just amazing that it works. And by the way, um, if anybody would like to, uh, you know, uh, hear more of Vincent, uh, they can head over to Fib. He's a regular uh, panelist, and uh, he's been a guest as well. So whenever there's a, an important virus story that's, uh, you know, it goes beyond the breadth of one show, uh, we pull you on, and it's it's been really good to have you. Yeah, we uh, we have fun because you guys do video. You can always watch yourself being silly, <laughs> but uh, it's a lot of fun. I I love the the panelists you have they're just great scientists interesting stuff uh, and i look forward to our next one i think in march or sometime right yeah and it, it's really hard to get um uh science right it's really hard even for scientists yeah i noticed know. that when i was doing science <laughs> exactly it's ex <laughs> it's extremely hard then to communicate it uh is hard and it takes a scientist to communicate it but then a scientist that can communicate it right is really tough and yeah. uh vincent's been able to do it uh you know in and out uh very effectively so that's you know that's definitely why i'd love to have him on the show we're gonna have carla kirkegaard on an oh, upcoming cool. show yeah yeah alan should know that name right yeah certainly yeah we're, it's gonna be carla myself and mark and that'll be fun that yeah. sounds like a great panel. Yeah, at least there's one good-looking person on the panel. <laughs> so that'll be fun. Yeah, anyway, check out uh, twit.tv, F-I-B. Not twiv, that's twit.tv. And it's no secret that I did borrow the This Week In from Leo Laporte. So today I picked a couple of stories that I thought you, Mark, would be particularly interested in. We don't want you falling asleep there. Because <laughs> uh, they sort of uh, all in, involve, well, I know the first one involves prions, which you're fascinated with. And mm -hmm. um, the second two involve uh, what, what you might call uh, biotechnology, which is, which is your thing. Because you also, you also work in a biotech company, right? Yeah. It was a, a spinoff that I spun out of Yale uh, in 2007. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a project that was begging to be done. Uh, I'm working on brain swelling. 
And a fellow had uh, come to Yale and presented data on animals where a gene had been knocked out and their brains would not swell after stroke, meningitis, uh, traumatic brain injury. No matter what you did to these mice, the brain stayed put. They didn't swell. So we've been uh, developing drugs towards that target. And uh, it's been fun. It's a hell of a ride, you know, to do the entrepreneurial kind of science. I'm uh, sure. Yeah. So are you the main person in the company? Are you the... Did you found it or you co-founded yep, it? Indeed, indeed. We're three people right now, so it's really small. But uh, <laughs> we spend a lot of money. Yeah. It's so expensive. Um, I'm realizing it now. So, um, yeah, it's, and it's working out. So, luckily, uh, things are moving forward. Uh, hopefully, within uh, three to four years, we'll have it cured at least in a mouse and rat. Wow. Right? There's a lot of people have brain swelling. Um, you know, there's five million people living with injury as a result of traumatic brain injury, you know, car accidents yeah, and stuff. Sure. Uh, and 50, explosives. Die. Yeah. Or oh, the military, it's a huge problem for the military. Yeah. One, one out of five uh, war fighters comes back, uh, goes to Walter Reed and uh, shows signs of having suffered uh, TBI. Hmm. Even TBI. So it's a massive 700,000 people who have stroke every year. You know, uh, about 100,000 die and the major complication is brain swelling. So we're, we're talking in the order of magnitude of 200,000 people in the U.S. alone that die from yeah, brains. Yeah. So if we can make a drug that helps. That's great, uh, yeah. Do you ever, have you ever talked about your work on, on uh, Futures in Biotech? N here and there, peppered. <laughs> I try not to because um, the only way to develop a drug is to raise money to develop uh, that drug. Yeah, yeah, sure. The only way to raise money to develop that drug is to keep the intellectual property protected such that <laughs> yeah, you can yeah, sure. guarantee that there's something to leverage. It's the intellectual property that leverages the funds to invest in the science that develops it. So you've got to be really careful. Yeah. Yep. Well, at some point when it's out, when you have a drug that's being sold, yeah, <laughs> you, should, you should do an episode where you have someone. Don't forget about us. Don't forget about us. Yeah, they'll be, uh, I'll be shouting it. <laughs> be real, no, it's an interesting story. And you get a couple of people who could question you. You know, you could be the, the, uh, the guest, so to speak, on that episode. It would be fun. Anyway, today's stories are all things I think that are. Uh, medically relevant. The first one uh, was sent to me by a listener, Len. Thanks very much, Len. And this was a story that came out on ProMed Mail. And the title of the story was Chronic Wasting Disease in Cervids in West Virginia. And uh, I understand that a cervid is a hoofed ruminant. Is that right, yes. Alan? Yes. Like a deer or an elk. That's right. Yeah, you okay. asked the Western Mass guy about this, right? <laughs> no, no, the science writer. That's right. <laughs> yes. are, are these deer that just throw out trash and never recycle? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, they're deer who drink too much. That's right. <laughs> chronic wasting. Because it's a great name, chronic wasting disease. I, I heard about this uh, when I was a graduate student. Such great names. This is one of the transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, TSEs. And, you know, I, I, whenever I go through the airport, I think of this. Because you know the the security guys are TSA, right? <laughs> right. I always think of the TSEs. Ah, oh, spongiform encephalopathies. So spongiform because the disease involves getting little holes in your in your brain tissue. Basically, it makes it look like a sponge. And encephalopathy encephalopathy is just a, a disease of the brain. And uh, there are animal and human TSEs. This is one of the animal ones. And so apparently they have 16 cases in a certain county in West Virginia. And what happens is when, when you hunt deer, um, you're supposed to give some of them or parts of some of them to the uh, Division of Natural Resources. And they, looked for, they look for this disease because it's, it's on, the, on the rise. Um, 22 states, I think. 22 states. There's actually a nice map. There's a website called the Chronic Wasting Disease Alliance. I think it's largely for hunters who want to uh, keep up because you hunt deer, you want to eat it. And so far, um, there hasn't been any infection of people of this disease, but hunters are concerned. So there are 22 states also up oh, in wait, Canada. Uh, right? The CDC says 11 states and two Canadian provinces. Oh, okay. But I don't states. know. Uh, I mean, there's the issue that you only find it when you've actually looked for it and... and yeah happened to get the brain of an of an animal that was affected. So it, it is quite likely more widespread. Yeah, two western Canadian provinces, bunch of states out west, New Mexico looks like 
but also New York. New York, yeah. There's some upstate New York and then West Virginia. I'm sure it's in more states. We just haven't found it. I, I would be shocked yeah. if it were not through through most of these areas. I thought this would be a good time to talk about prions because we haven't really done that on TWIV. Uh, because there are not only these are long term infections. They take a long time to develop. They're neurological diseases. You get you, know, you you can't walk properly. You have dementia, and after years you die. And the deer follow the same course as people. Uh, there there's there are TSEs of deer, uh, exotic animals, cats, sheep, goats, mink, and well, and of course bovine spongiform encephalopathy, the famous BSE. Mad cow disease, and then there are human TSEs: Creutzfeldt, Jakob. Um, Gersh- How's it spread? How's it spread? Ah, well, there are a couple of ways. There are some infectious ones. There are some cases of infectious spread. So, like among the deer, um, they think that uh, the deer rub against each other and, and spread the infectious agent, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but deer typically don't eat meat, right? Right. Right. No. They don't. Well, so, they, they, they eat uh, placenta. <laughs> all right. So that could, so an infected deer, uh, if, so there are sporadic cases of these infections where you, you just develop it without any infection where, or without a genetic component. And then if a deer ate the placenta of, of that kind of a deer that had the sporadic disease, they would get it and then pass it on. And they, they, they mention at the CDC site, I think, that some, they think the deer may rub against each other and spread it that way. But Dick de Pommier would say, well, any animal will eat meat if it's hungry enough. So, no. <laughs> you know, like maybe, you, maybe. Rabbits. I don't know. But uh, there are... With big teeth. You know, there are three basic kinds of disease. There's an infectious disease where, like, you eat the meat of a cow that has BSE and then you get infected. There is um, a genetic kind of disease where you have a mutation in the protein that causes this disease, and at some point in your life that takes off. And then there's what's called sporadic, where you just get the disease all of a sudden. There's no genetic component. There's no infectious component, but you get it. And no, that, yeah. I, I've, I've got a, there's, there's you know, some underlying aspects of this, right? In, in that the protein itself that you know, the underlying problem is, is it's a protein that aggregates and forms the, the, the aggregates in the brain and causing lesions and stuff. Right. Although they, they're not sure whether it's the aggregate, you know, the, the aggregates are basically clumps of fibers. Right. It's whether those are what are um, uh, lethal or, or damaging, or is it the intermediate transition state yeah. between the two conformations of these proteins? So it's it's a very, fear- very similar to the situation with Alzheimer's disease. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Right. So you have a protein that's like a dip switch. It has two states. And they're, they're not always pathogenic, right? Sometimes they, they can be for other, other uses, right? So you have, um, it's in one, in one shape that's a functional protein, might be a transcriptional activator, something that regulates gene expression. Then it gets sequestered out into the aggregate form. Now that aggregate form of a prion is what, the interesting part is it's, it's self-propagating, mm-hmm. right? So it can contribute to a non-Mendelian Phenotypic change. So right. it's genetic information that's not based on DNA. That's right. right. Well, it's, and, it's, it's, the protein, of course, is specified by DNA, but the, the misfolding is specified by the protein. Right. So there, there's so many cases. Uh, I, I hope you cut me off if you need to. Uh, so, but the, the, we should just say this is a disease caused by a protein, it's not a viral disease. There's no nucleic acid involved. And the interesting thing is on this. ProMed Mail um, dis- Dispatch, it says, mm, infected deer show no signs they are carrying the virus. <laughs> they, they mentioned virus two or three times, but it's not a virus. As they say, they don't got it right. <laughs> they don't have it right here. I don't know who wrote it. Probably the Division of Natural Resources. But um, It's hard enough to get uh, PR people and reporters to know the distinction oh, between so a bacterium and a virus. Uh, getting them to get the prions straight is going to take decades. Yeah. Well, it's a protein. It is it a has protein. Two right. Right. It goes uh, in one functional state, and then it aggregates. And that aggregation is a form of sequestration. You can take it out, and then by sequestering it, you can have a loss of change of, you know, gene control. Have you heard of CPEB? 
it's uh, from a, uh, the work of, of a, a colleague of yours over there at Columbia, um, Eric Kendall. Mm-hmm. Sure. He presented at the neuroscience meeting in October and he presented the most phenomenal data about prions. And he, he demonstrated that this one prion-like protein that's in the brain, in, in a neuron, it's, it encodes uh, a transcription factor. And uh, no, is it a transcription factor? It sounds like it's CPE. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah, yeah. It's a cytoplasmic polyadenylation element binding protein. <laughs> mm. Anyhow, what's interesting about this protein is that it's important in uh, controlling the expression of, of proteins in the neuron for long-term um, facilitation or mm. the, um, what, how does he say it, um, controlling the stabilization of learning-related synaptic growth, mm. right? So by, by turning into an amyloid, you no longer have the ability to uh, stabilize learning-related synaptic growth or memory. And what he did is instead of uh, taking, doing the knockout, he overexpressed it and he made the mice learn twice as fast. So he created these super smart mice and he called them um, IntelliMice, like your intelligent mice. Mm-hmm. Just by controlling the, the, the state or the abundance of this protein that can form a prion. So prions aren't necessarily diseases only. And I think um, if you look at the work of like Susan Linquist. Yeah, sure. Right, she's explored genomes to find out how many of these actually exist. These proteins that can act between these two states, and she's finding that, uh, in, at least in yeast, she she looked at a hundred experimentally just by looking at the genome. She looked at all oh, these look like by sequence they look like prion-like proteins, and then looked at a hundred experimentally and showed that nineteen of them formed amyloids mm-hmm. or no, it's not amyloids, sorry, prions. One of which increased. Um, the, the phenotypic diversity in a natural state. So they took the protein, it formed an, uh, a prion, and it allowed the yeast to have a highly capable uh, variety or a high variety of uh, phenotypes allowing it to adapt to a new environment. So it was a, that was the first true demonstration of a naturally causing prion that allows an organism to be more adaptable using a non-Mendelian genetic trait. Right, so it's... Right. It's even quicker than mutation. How fast does a mutation happen, right? A spontaneous mutation in DNA. Certainly not as quick as the transmissible form of a protein. Yeah, probably so. somewhat slower. If you have to replicate an entire genome to get the mutation expressed, yeah, it would be, fa- it would be slower, sure. So this fun stuff. Do, are- do we know if the human genome encodes any other proteins with these properties? With these, I don't know. I haven't looked, and uh, Sue Linquist would be the one to ask. Yeah. But if, if in yeast out of, uh, what, 3,000 genes, 100 were identified quickly. I think they identified 200 and they, they found, a, they tested 100 experimentally because right. it was feasible. So uh, if we have 19,000 genes, conserved biology at 70%, uh, we might have duplicates, but uh, maybe we have a couple of hundred. Yeah. And these contribute to things like memory. CPEB is one of them in the brain. So it, your memory, your ability to learn is based on this prion-like protein that mm-hmm. it's not pathogenic. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, most of the uh, research and attention comes from the fact that there is a disease associated with this one prion. Sure. Which, uh, by the way, is what's well, called the prion protein, and the gene in humans is PRNP. And must, much of the driving work in this area was done by Stan Prusiner, who purified, was the first to purify the prion protein, called it PRP, and showed that there are two forms. There's the normal form and the misfolded PRP superscript SC, standing for scrapey because that was a sheep TSC that was studied early on and, and were from which he got the, uh, the protein. He developed animal models. And, you know, the incubation time, <laughs> you put a misfolded prion into a mouse, it can take up to two years for it to develop disease. It's a horrible, horrible system to work on. Long, a long assay. So yeah. you have to give him and his group a lot of credit because he uh, has sweated through this. He actually got the Nobel Prize in 1997 for this. Yep. And uh, like a day after it was announced, he was giving a seminar here and uh, he came and he was great. He's just a very interesting guy. So you have this, and there's a gene that encodes it. Now the cool thing is, and of course this misfolded protein causes the deer, the wasting disease, all the animal TSEs, they're all different proteins, but similar diseases, and all the human TSEs are also caused by these misfolded proteins. 
And the mm-hmm. amazing thing is you can't sterilize them. You can't no. autoclave them or UV irradiate them to kill them. Phenol will do it. Mm, so I, 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 yeah, I guess it will, yes. Yeah, but, <laughs> but there's a limit to the number of things that you can treat that way. Do you want phenol? I don't, I don't want, want phenol. phenol. <laughs> it is but horrible, there, evil. There slug. are many instances of people getting Kreutzfeldt Jakob from instruments, so ophthalmological instruments that weren't properly, they were autoclaved, but it wasn't enough to get rid of the prion. There's a whole case where years ago, um, a hormone, growth hormone, human growth hormone was purified from cadavers, and a batch was contaminated with the prion, and it gave people Kreutzfeldt Jakob. So this is very scary in the sense that you can't get rid of it, Fortunately, we now have an assay. I think they can do Western blots for the for the protein. Yep. Have a biological I, assay in animals. Now, the, here's a cool result, which I really think nailed it. So, in mice, uh, if you give them a misfolded prion protein, they develop the disease. If you knock out the gene for the prion protein in mice, then they're resistant to the so disease. We need to make a prion-free cow. Yes, yeah, so the people are talking about that, right? So there's no more BSE. Well, but um, then the question, then you'd really find out what this protein does. Well, in mice, when you knock it out, they seem to be fine. Yeah, they're fine. But Have you taken them to the opera? I haven't taken them to the <laughs> opera, that's right. That's they don't right. enjoy it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I don't know about cows. I don't know if anyone's made a knockout cow. Do you? Does anyone know? No, and it, the, I mentioned it because I heard uh, my uh, PhD mentor like eight years ago talk about it. He said, "You know what'd be really great? A prion-free cow." So yeah. I'm not I'm not taking credit for that idea. He's uh, it was Dave Thomas eight years ago that first mentioned it, and the first time I heard of the possibility. And he's he he kind of thinks that way. Have I ever told you the story of, uh, of my how my dream came true? Because w- w- my wife was working on prions. She works now on prions. She was. She, she was. was. Oh, cool. Tell about, us. Uh, so she was working in a cold room, and they had a brain from a patient uh, from South America with CJ. I, I can't pronounce it. Can you please pronounce it for me? Kreutzfeld Jakob. <laughs> Thank you. So anyhow, they were cutting up the brain, and they were going to do some analysis on it, and they lost a piece. Wow. Right? And this is an effect, uh, infectious agent, protein yeah. that can transmit itself. And so what did they have to do? They're in a cold room, and they lost a piece of brain. So they had to strip down. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to bring it in the gutter, but it's really funny. Here's my wife and her and her uh, her boss, uh, you know, uh, um, female boss, by the way, <laughs> getting undressed, looking for the piece of brain. And fortunately, they found it, so they're both safe. Wow. But, uh, you know, I wasn't there, so I didn't get to enjoy it. But <laughs> cool. it would have been fun. No, I, I, this is a, it's an interesting field. I'm fa- I've always been fascinated. I don't want to work on it. It takes too long, but uh, I think. Prusner has shortened the incubation times. He uses golden Syrian hamsters, and there's a shorter incubation time now, and you can do a lot more. But uh, in in England, of course, the big scare was this uh, disease got into the agricultural cows that are used for meat, probably through feed, and they make the feed by grinding up other dead animals, other cows and pigs, I think. And my, my understanding is at some point years ago they stopped rendering it in a way that probably stopped getting rid of the the prion protein. And that entered the herd, and uh, a lot of cows started getting BSE. And then uh, they stopped the feed practices, but then apparently had gotten into the human food chain. And this new disease called variant Kreutzfeldt-Jakob arose in people, had a, a lower target age and slightly different symptoms, different incubation periods, and it's thought that that originated from the bovine protein. So these proteins can cross species sometimes. Mm-hmm. Sure. So the, well, the cow protein can infect people. We're fairly close to cows genetically. So the, 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 the protein structure that forms off the, the protein, which is you know, probably 90% identical to human, the electric you know, chemical properties are, are so close that you know, the 3D structure is so close that the lock and key fits. And uh, let's hope that this deer one uh, is di- far enough away from our version of the proof. Yeah, I mean, that's a good. That's the point that I want to end here is that you know on the CDC side and on this um, chronic wasting disease alliance side, they said there's been no evidence so far of it going from deer to people. But I would be really careful because in in mouse models, it only takes one amino acid change for a different species of prion to infect the mouse. Mm-hmm. So you no. can imagine that happening easily in a deer, right? 
Well, it'll, it'll be important to understand how these prions work and identify the ones that cause disease right? Um, so that we can limit its spread. But I do not think we'll be able to... The protein in its uh, fiber-like state is, is the, it's the harshest, it's the most solid form of a pro- protein conformation that you can make. I used to make some. Uh, it was an amyloid. And it would sit in methanol, pure methanol, for the entire year. And I'd take little samples out, wash it with water, and throw it in, under the electron microscope. And they never changed. They never mm. got hurt. You can't get rid of them. There's no unfolding enzyme in the human body or, or anything that can be engineered that is strong enough to pull these, uh, the structure apart. Mm. Really wild stuff. I don't know. I wouldn't eat deer, but you know it is kind of rare. But um, I'd be careful because they say you know if the deer looks bad, then when they're very sick and close to dying, they look awful. But they can be earlier in the disease and uh, they look fine, and they would still have the prion. Sure. So you could acquire it. So I'd be really careful. But it tastes good. <laughs> so it, I, it is very tasty. It's yes. tasty, but if you, even if you cook it, it's not going to kill the infectivity of but the prion. But that presumes that presumes the prion is in the meat. Yeah. As opposed to the spinal cord, for, yeah. for example, yeah. Or, yeah. Or in the now, what, I, what I would worry about is there are, um, for example, there are traditional ways of tanning uh, deer hides, um, where you take the brain of the animal and you grind it up, and that's actually a good tanning compound to ah, make I see. to tan the hide. Um, I certainly wouldn't do that, and yeah. I, I wouldn't recommend doing that because anything where you're butchering and handling the um, uh, the brain tissue is is Probably just a really bad idea at this point. Yeah. Well, they do say in these sites that you should stay away from the brain and spinal cord. Yeah. I guess most hunters just take the uh, muscles, right? Yeah, they they'll field gut it and then um, and then take the rest of the carcass. And, and usually in rural areas, you'll see signs saying we we'll butcher your deer here, and and the place will just cut all the meat off, and they throw away the uh, the spine and the the mm. skull and everything. Really, they should pass it on to the to the uh, Division of Natural Resources and check it for for the uh, sure. prion. And well, I think you- a lot of st- I think a lot of states now have a program where they're um, at the at the checking stations when the game wardens are there mm. checking the deer. They take the sample then. Yeah, it's, I think then you hold it in your freezer until you find out if that particular deer was positive or not. Yeah, if, personally, if it's positive, I wouldn't eat it. No, no, that's true. I've, if if you <laughs> are having the test done, I would wait for the results. Yeah, what we need is a scanner, Mark. That can you can scan your dead deer, and it says prion. <laughs> Leave it there. Yeah, or not. tricorder, tricorder, tricorder. Yes. tricorder. Yes. <laughs> that's what we need. We'll have one someday. I'm not sure in our lifetimes, but we'll have that. Anyway, I, I like that story. I thought you would like that because you talk a lot about yeast prions on your show. Sure. And uh, this is real world stuff. Well, it's changing, you know, how we, uh, our understanding of how memory works and evolution, yeah. right? We're not just genetic, we're yep. protein yep. evolution. Yep. It's fun stuff. Okay, we have uh, two more cool stories. Actually, one more that involves amyloid. So an amyloid is just an aggre- a protein aggregate, right? Uh, fibrils of a protein? Yeah, so it, you get your protein. It's got one shape. It looks like a protein that can bind to DNA. Or whatever. Mostly, it's it's that kind of protein. Right. It unstretches, and the peptide backbone of the protein then forms a, a, a beta sheet that looks like a ladder. So, if you could imagine two ladders, you know, painter's ladders, mm-hmm. or you know, that can get you to the second floor of your house side by side, that's the atomic structure of an amyloid. And because it's on the backbone, uh, the the carbon alpha uh, backbone. Um, it's extremely stable, and any protein can form it. Mm. Right? So that's why it's so universal. Right. Pretty wild stuff. So imagine two ladders sitting at 11 angstroms apart, I think. Yeah. You know, I, have a, I, have a great, <laughs> uh, I have a great picture of the transition. In the, yeah, it looks just like a ladder. It's amazing. I've never seen a protein like that. Yeah. So we, we do have another story about amyloids. But before we do that, I want to acknowledge the support of TWIV by Data Robotics, the makers of Drobo. And Drobo, of course, is a backup solution for your computer. Uh, and if you go to drobo.com slash twiv, you'll see that they have made a nice uh, page for twiv listeners where you can go and uh, learn all about this this backup solution. I have now three drobos. These are beautiful little black boxes that you can slip up to eight hard drives into and back up your computer. You can plug it in via USB or Firewire, and it's redundant backup. It's Basically, everything is protected if one of the drives fails on the four uh, drive model. You can just pop it out and put a new one in 
and all your data are restored. And I use them at home extensively for photos, for music, movies, and twivs and twips, of course, to back them all up. And I just acquired a third one, which I'm using in my lab. Uh, it's an obvious uh, solution for your home, but also if you have a lab, if you have a research lab or a medical office of any kind, it's great for putting your data on because it's protected. That, Mark, do you have any Drobos? I don't have Drobos. I have a, a long a daisy chain of crappy drives. Right, you, ought to, you ought to get a Drobo for aeromics. I know. I know. We're going to do it. We're, we're just building the, uh, our computational ecosystem now. Spending all our money on chemistry. <laughs> but they're definitely, yeah. you know, if, if the file isn't on three drives, it doesn't exist. Right. Now, the, these are uh, cost effective. They're, I tell you, we bought a, an Apple RAID years ago. It was hugely expensive, and this is much cheaper, and it works, and you plug it in and forget it. You can fill it yourself, right? With fill it yourself. $80 drives? $80 terabyte drives, absolutely. And I've had drives fail, and I pull it out, put a new one in, and that's it. And they always fail, I can tell you. And I've had two Drobos for a couple of years, and each in each a, a drive has failed. Doesn't Every matter. drive will fail. They will. It doesn't sure. matter who makes it or, or how old, it will fail. Yeah. <laughs> Death, taxes, and failed drives. Fail tra <laughs> yes. Exactly. So uh, we highly recommend uh, you check out Drobo. I know Dick de Palmier just got one, and he's going to put all his photographs. He's off in Argentina photographing, and he's going to put all his photographs on and protect. Right now, he's got a chain of crappy drives, just like you do, Mark. <laughs> I, I actually also have a chain of crappy drives. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great uh, endorsement, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so well, no, I'm, I'm now looking. I'm now looking at this uh, this week in virology deal, and um, and I, I think I'm probably going to take advantage of this. Yeah, you can get fifty dollars off a Drobo or a hundred dollars off a Drobo S. Uh, use the promo code Vincent in capital letters. Go to oh, cool <laughs> Drobo.com/slash/twiv, and you can see all that info. There are. There's product info. There are nice videos by Callie Lewis of uh, Geek Brief TV, shows mm -hmm. you, who shows you how to work it. And I'm, I'll, uh, I just want to let everyone know that uh, we're going to have a contest to give away a couple of these uh, robos, and we'll probably announce the details next week. And uh, we have three to give away, one a month. Robo's been very nice to us, and uh, we can um, we're going to think up some kind of interesting contest that somehow involves virology. And uh, have people read. So, so stay tuned to TWIV to hear that next week. But uh, in the meantime, go over to drobo.com slash TWIV and check out all the info. And if you if you want to buy one, do it through uh, you, through the promo code Vincent and help support TWIV. And save some money. And save some money. Great products, I can tell you. I use them every day. $100? Up to 100 bucks. 100 off on the Drobo S, which is a, a four-drive model with different features from the regular Drobo. I have two Drobos. Uh, three Drobos. <laughs> so it's a good deal. Check yeah. it out. And we're really grateful to Data Robotics for their support of TWIV. And I think our listeners are a unique audience that probably uh, hasn't heard much about Drobos. So do check it out. Okay. Our next story is another story I picked. It's of great interest, but I thought Mark would like this. It is a two-part two story. The, the most recent paper just came out this month. The title of that is Aminoquinolone Surfin, S-U-R-F-E-N, inhibits the action of S-E-V-I. Boy, a cryptic title. <laughs> it doesn't get any more cryptic than that. It's accurate, though. It yes. is accurate. So this is basically saying a compound called surfin inhibits uh, the action of S-E-V-I, which is semen-derived enhancer of viral infection. So this, uh, to understand this story, this revolves around HIV. We have to go back a couple of years to a paper that came out in Cell in 2007. And this uh, paper, let's see if I can get it up here on my screen. Let's close down prions here. We don't need that anymore. Okay, it's a Cell paper. Semen-derived amyloid fibrils drastically enhance HIV infection. This is an amazing paper, which... I missed two years ago. I did too. So HIV, of course, is sexually transmitted. And m most of the transmission is from HIV positive men, either to other men or women. Those are the major forms. So most of the virus is born in the semen. And um, so these guys, you know, they, they, they were kind of puzzled by uh, 
the efficiency of that process. It's not terribly efficient. Uh, there's a number here that is quite interesting. The, the risk of male to female intravaginal HIV transmission is one event per 200 to 2,000 coital acts. It's pretty low. So every time you have sex, you don't necessarily going to get uh, HIV transmission, although you could, of course, could be that one time. Anyway, they were interested in that at low efficiency. So they are, have been looking in semen to see if they're compounds that influence HIV infectivity. So in this paper, they did an experiment where they basically take semen and they put one molar acetic acid into it, which breaks up all the protein into peptides. And then they fractionate the peptides by high pressure liquid chromatography. And they say, are there any fractions with specific peptides that do something to HIV? And the bottom line is they, so they, they take the fractions and mix them with virus and put them in cell cultures and see how the virus goes. And they found a peptide, a specific peptide, that dramatically enhances the infectivity of HIV. And they do it in both in cells and they also did it in animals. It's about a 40 amino acid peptide. And in some cases, it enhances infectivity by five orders of magnitude. That's a lot. It turns out the peptide is derived from a, a very abundant protein in semen called prostatic acidic phosphatase. And the peptide forms amyloid fibrils. Mm. And what it does, it binds the virus and the, and the cell surface and enhances infectivity in the fibril form. So you can imagine this peptide. So first you have a protein, prostatic acid phosphatase. Their idea is that uh, when the semen gets into the vagina or the rectum, it's chopped up and you get peptides made and they form fibrils. And they find these fibrils in, in semen. So they think that's how they originate from the protein. And those fibrils bind the virus and the cell surface. And that's how they enhance infection. That's amazing that the virus picked up on this. It had evolved, man. That's, yeah. These viruses do that, you know? <laughs> Which made me wonder how many other sexually transmitted pathogens have uh, have hit on this. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. I mean, with viruses, you know, you have this wonderful Darwinian selection. You make so many, and there's going to be some mutants among them that can do different things. So you, you select for this. So the idea is that viruses, you know, envelope viruses are negatively charged. The cell surface is negatively charged. So if you have a positively charged peptide, then that helps the two to get together. Mm. And even and in fact, in the lab here, there's an HIV lab on my floor. They routinely add uh, positively charged compounds when they infect cells with HIV. There's a common one called polybreen and enhances the infectivity of the virus in cell culture. So here they showed that this compound is in semen it enhances infectivity. And so, very interesting. And obviously, the first thing you can think of is, is it a target? Could you somehow target this interaction between the amyloids and uh, the virus? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everybody okay so far with that? Oh, yeah. Sure, yeah. Can you block that advantage right. Of, right. Uh, provided by that protein? So that's where the second paper comes in. This compound surfin, S-U-R-F-E-N. Surfin was a previously known antagonist of the interaction of um, compounds with heparan sulfates on the surfaces of cells. So heparan sulfate, heparan sulfate proteoglycans are long carbohydrate protein complexes that are found on cell surfaces, and surfin had been identified as, as something that interacts with this and, and blocks uh, things from interacting with these heparin sulfate molecules. And indeed, what they find is that surfin blocks uh, the effect of this semen-derived enhancer of viral infection, which is SEVI. And so they add it to cells in the presence of the SEVI, and it blocks the uh, enhancement of uh, infection. Um, and they That's have pretty good in blocking, which suggest, and they suggest maybe this would be a good compound to put in a, um, an ointment or a Sure. A gel or, of some yeah. kind. In the condom package. Exactly. Right. Effectivity agents. That'd be pretty great. Yeah. And it's kind of timely because I think there was just a trial of a uh, microbicide for uh, preventing HIV acquisition in women, and it failed miserably. And they, they talk about this in the discussion 
that they these microbicides actually made the infection rate worse in the women who used them. And they think they probably induced chemokines that attracted cells that are susceptible to HIV in, in the vagina. Mm. And that's why they, they were worse off. But they, they say this one probably doesn't do that, and so this might be better. So uh, I think this is pretty neat. Uh, first of all, I didn't know that there were amyloids formed in semen and that those are enhancing virus infection, and then you can block that. So this is a great biotech story, Mark. <laughs> Absolutely, especially if surfin's been FDA approved. Uh, it, it, so is it an anti-heparin agent? Is that what you, you were saying? That it, was, it can be used to, as an anti-heparin. Um, I, I've taken heparin. Uh, you take heparin um, as a, a way to reduce coagulation in your blood mm-hmm. um, quickly, and one that is reversible versus Coumadin, which it takes you know days to build on. Right. So surfin is a recently identified small molecule antagonist of heparin sulfate proteoglycan. Okay, so it might not have hit the... It hasn't been FDA approved I yet. I don't think, but it's, it's been around since 1938. Oh, <laughs> then we know the toxicology for sure. It has anti-inflammatory and antibacterial activity. All right. And it's been shown to block a number. So it blocks fibronectin binding to heparin sulfate, for example. Has a company been formed? Have these guys... <laughs> you know, Sorry. you can probably bet that it has been, right? Mm, you know, when it's an academic paper, it doesn't mean that they've, they've done it right. No. Well, also, necessary. if this compound, I mean, depending... On the history of this compound, it may be very difficult to get intellectual property to it. It's true. Yeah. That's right. I mean, it may be it may be sufficiently in the public domain that um, nobody's going to put it put piles of money into this. Well, sure, but you know, here's the big uh, thing: is when the fivefold in- improvement, and this is a drug off a shelf, right? Yeah. Uh, give yeah. it to me for two years, and I will improve the potency to get it down to a, th- a hundred to a thousand times more potent. Yeah, that's a good point. You want this to be non-prescription, off the shelf, right? In a right. microbicide. Well, this is a lead, right? You can now use this yeah, to develop exactly. uh, other compounds, which may it's be more starting. active. And you then you can have IP intellectual property with whatever else you develop, right? Mm-hmm. So I think it's a great example of you do basic science. You ask what's in semen that's affecting the virus. You find something, and then you can get real life uh, compounds out of that. And that's the, that's when science works best. Can you assume that a virus is going to take advantage of that kind of environment? I mean, do all viruses have strategies beyond just finding the receptor, infecting the cell? I'll bet, yes. You know, I, I've always been simplistic in my view. You know, the virus attaches to the receptor and gets in. But this shows that it's mu- it's a lot more complex than that. And I bet for a lot of enveloped viruses, there are other compounds that facilitate or block infection, depending on the tissue. It may determine what tissues get infected, right? Mm-hmm. If you don't have a compound like this, the virus never finds a cell surface and it doesn't infect. So I, I, what I've learned is that viruses can do anything. And you should always, you should never assume that things are not happening, that there's always multiple levels of complexity. I'm always amazed at what we find. I always think, gosh, I thought I understood this. And here we have another level. So I think that's really neat. So maybe we'll see something, and then this this is not going to prevent HIV infection, but it will lower the risk and maybe combined with other activities will help, right? I mean, this is not a prescription. It's not going to be expensive, so it can be used. That's why microbicides are being tested. Have you guys done a show on uh, viral um, strategies for immune evasion? Not yet. Uh, like the work of Hide Plu. I, I can't pronounce his name. Hide Plu, that's perfect, yeah. Yeah, he, he's you know been working on something for about like 15 years, 20 have years. You, have you had him on uh, FIB? Well, I thought about have it going to his lab. I, I actually uh, gave a talk at his lab to decide whether or not I'd want to do a postdoc there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that was my, I really wanted to work in, 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 in virology and, and, and that's what was my first visit. And then I realized I couldn't fish for bluefish after work living in Boston, so I went to Yale. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's easier. You lived on the shoreline, you know. <laughs> yeah, he's great. He's great. He's but terrific he's, stuff. We're going to do, we'll definitely do multiple evasion uh, twibs. It's incredible. It's an incredible story. Mark, the thing about viruses is we can have twibs every week for the rest of our <laughs> lives and never have a shortage of things to talk about. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, that's, as long as people listen, we keep going, right? 
they're also scary, but they're fascinating. So it's a scary, fascinating thing. There's always been movies that have, have come up, and the great it makes a great story arc. You know, you know, I I started teaching a new virology class th- uh, this week at uh, to undergraduates here, and one thing I told them is that if you don't understand viruses, you're scared by them. Mm-hmm. But if you do, you realize that they're not all bad, and they do a lot of good things. And they sure. said one of the things I wanted you to get out of this course is not to be afraid of viruses because fear comes from lack of knowledge most of the time. Just like sharks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> if you understood sharks, you would love them. Yeah, and you'd swim with them. <laughs> right. You don't look, as long as you don't look like a seal, you're fine. Yeah, that's if true. You, you dress like a seal, you look like a seal. That's you, right. You smell like a seal. How are we doing on time, uh, Alan? <laughs> I actually, I realized that the, um, the interview that I have scheduled is uh, on mountain time. So um, oh. I don't have to leave it too. Excellent. All right, good. Then we can do our last story, which I just picked up last night, and I thought you guys would love this, and it uses a virus. So I figured, what the heck? Actually, I saw the photograph accompanying this article. The title is Transgenic Rabbit Production with Simian Immunodeficiency Virus-Derived Lentiviral Vector. And one of the pictures is of a green fluorescent rabbit. I don't know if you guys have seen it in this paper. It's is it, figure four. Yes. Is, is Look it an at angry that. rabbit? Angry? Uh, it's hard to tell. but <laughs> It you looks kind of spooky. Very spooky. The Hulk rabbit. The whole thing is glowing green. Yeah. I mean, I've seen transgenic pigs with yellow and green snouts and fish. But apparently, it's uh, not been easy to make transgenic rabbits. And, I, and it says in this article that they're great models for certain diseases like atherosclerosis, lipoprotein metabolism, cardiovascular diseases. They more closely mimic what happens in people than in mice. And I didn't know that. So, oh, look at this. Transgenic rabbits are used as bioreactors. Yes. Oh, they're can, awesome. You can make proteins in their milk. Right. Antibodies all the time. And yeah. So what they say here is that it's not very efficient. So the normal way to make a transgenic animal... You take out an egg and you inject with a small needle DNA into the egg. Then you put it back in a female, and then hopefully they give rise, they give birth to animals that incorporate that DNA uh, into their genome. So what they do in this paper is to take the egg, and instead of putting DNA in it, they inject a lentiviral vector, a retrovirus vector. And the gene they used to demonstrate it was green fluorescent protein. The guy who first did that, of course, was Marty Chalfie in, in C. elegans, who was a guest of yours on Futures in Biotech. Yeah, we're lucky to have him on a couple of times. So he, he was a very nice guy. So he's the chair of biology, and I had to get his approval to teach this new course. So <laughs> there you go. He really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's wow. He's chair of biology here. So um, what you do with these vectors, you take, the, you take a retroviral genome. So they use simian immunodeficiency virus, which is a simian version of AIDS virus. And um, they, use, they use these viruses because they will infect any kind of cell. Uh, other retroviruses are, are only going to infect uh, cells that divide, and these will infect non-dividing cells as well as dividing cells. You, you take out all the viral genes and you put in green fluorescent protein. You just leave a few bits at the end of the genome. And then you, so you have now a plasmid containing green fluorescent protein, a little bit of this simian lentivirus, and then you put that into a cell that provides the capsid of the virus on a separate plasmid. And finally, they use a glycoprotein derived from vesicular stomatitis virus. So you get this hybrid virus, which is mainly a simian immunodeficiency virus, but the glycoprotein on the virus that's going to be used to attach to cells is derived from VSV. And the reason you do that is because the VSV glycoprotein will bind just about any kind of cell. So this will infect many different kinds of cells uh, in the rabbit, including the egg. So the, the viral particle is, uh, has an envelope that has glycoproteins with right. the, the, the sugars coating that, that outside envelope. Right. And the, the, the main protein in that envelope is not the original viral glycoprotein. That's gone. But this glycoprotein from VSV, which is a mm-hmm. virus that's related to rabies but, but doesn't cause rabies. And when you say simian, that's monkey. It's monkey, right? So this is a virus that causes AIDS and some kinds of monkeys. So you're, so you're engineering a somewhat promiscuous virus to become an extremely promiscuous virus so that right. it'll infect pretty much any cell it encounters. Yeah. And in fact, and a, these, ve- these vectors are used in human gene therapy. They're mm-hmm. quite safe, 
Um, they're, they're very defective. They're not going to spread very much, but um, they infect non-dividing cells. And so if you want to do uh, infect stem cells of any kind, right, you have to use these kinds of vectors. Other retroviral vectors don't work. So anyway, they take this virus, they inject it into the egg of the rabbit, and they get transgenic rabbits at good efficiencies. And so this probably will be uh, the method of choice. It's no more complicated than the existing method. It's injecting DNA into the rabbit egg. Right. You still have to, um, even with the existing method, you still have to make a construct, and this just changes what the uh, design of the construct yeah. is. Yeah, because in transgenic, typically you make a plasmid with the gene. You have a promoter in it and regulatory sequences, and so it's very similar. You don't actually put virus in. Well, it's, yeah, I'm sorry, you do put virus in here, so you have to make the virus, but that's not very hard with these vector systems. So you're injecting virus instead of DNA. Is there a kit for this? For, for lentiviral kits? <laughs> kits, probably, I'm sure. Yeah. You can buy these vectors with all the appropriate plasmids that you need. Well, this is great, though, to have transgenic rabbits. You know, when you're working on an animal model for a specific disease, as you said, mice, in some cases, when you cure a mouse, it doesn't mean you're going to cure a human. You right. have to go, to, right. go into the larger mammals and... Here's one where we already know how to grow them. <laughs> they, sure. they, they, they they breed like rabbits. So right? for your they, swelling uh, experiments, sure. you, do you ever use rabbits there or could you? Uh, we use mice um, and, and we're going to use rats. Um, we're waiting on approval for the, uh, mm -hmm. the animal protocol right now. Um, and we're, we're doing work at Case. So we've got to sort of uh, get inter institutional agreements in place. Right. I mean, working on animals is just not, you don't just do it. It's not easy. Everything has to be you know, very, very tightly controlled. And even down to the point on how you kill the animal, uh, everything has to be overseen by a vet to make sure that there's no cruelty and there's no... Sure. So this animal work is extremely, extremely... Uh, there's a high level of organization overseeing uh, that we do it right and do it ethically. So yeah. I don't want to scare anybody out there that, you know, hey, we're just using animals and just, you know, cutting their heads yeah, open. No, and, no. I'll second it's, that. We have the same here. We have a entire committee that... You have to submit your protocols to and have it approved and modified how many, many how times. Many mice? How many mice are you going to yeah. use? Are you going to use eight or are you going to use nine? Why? And then they say yeah. eight, and they say, why? Why not five? You know? <laughs> right, exactly. And, you know, we eat chicken all the time. You go to, uh, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken, how many chickens they go through in a day, right? But that being said, um, <laughs> the, it's important <laughs> to have this oversight. And for some reason, you can still buy glue traps off the shelf. I, I don't understand, yeah. That's right. No, when people have mice in their house, they want them trapped and killed, right? right? Now, I'm, I'm going to do a, a project where I trap wild mice and uh, look for viruses, and I have to go through the committee as well. Even though none of them will ever come back here, I'm bringing back uh, organs, um, still have to do it, which is okay. Uh, this paper, they have a neat figure where they take all different organs out of these rabbits, and they take pictures of kidney, heart, lung, muscle, even eyeball. They take a light photograph and then they take one under UV light to show that it's green. Yeah. <laughs> the transgene is everywhere. Anyway, so that's using a virus vector and uh, biotechnology. That's what it's all about. I'm amazed this hasn't naturally evolved. How come there's no green rabbits? I mean, if they were green, you wouldn't see them in the grass, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, Don't let this one out because it'll wipe out the whole population. <laughs> but, yeah, but, uh, but if they glow in the dark, I think the snakes would find them. But the jellyfish are green, you know, the ones yeah. that had this gene. So if and you go, in the blue ocean, I've right? done this. I've gone to the to the shore of Jersey at night. You just take a net and, and uh, rub it in the water, and you, all the jellyfish glow because you're. Oh, but in, in the wake of a boat when you're when you're offshore at night, you see these globules <laughs> yeah. coming out. It's, you know, <laughs> are you cool. sure that's GFP though? <laughs> I um, might be in, sure. It I'm may be another yeah. form. Um, yeah, but they're all fluorescent proteins. Oh, right. Like if you're in Lake Erie, it might be different. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. <laughs> but no, actually, Lake Erie's cleaned up quite a bit, and so is the right. uh, the, the coastline. Right. Thank, New York. thank you, zebra mussels. I have yeah. a, I have a friend who uh, has, runs a biotech company in the Jersey Shore, and I remember years ago he brought me. He had a house uh, with a dock, and he said, "Look at this." And he put his net in the water, and he showed me the glowing jellies. And he said, "If I had thought of this ten years ago, I'd be rich." <laughs> <laughs> and it's true, you know, whoever said, hmm, this could be an interesting protein. Yeah, well, that's seems. Marty, right? Uh, well, someone else had found the protein. He thought of yeah. putting it in a, an animal, yeah. As a biological marker. 
It's a great you know, it's idea. The, just a, it's the most important uh, biological marker. I don't think there's a, a more important uh, important way to look at the life of a protein in a cell than That's to right. have a recombinant, you know, fusion protein, your favorite protein, the one you're studying, attach a little GFP into it, and then you can look at single molecule migration of that protein when it gets made. You know, it's just and it's everything we know about proteins in a live cell is now possible because of GFP. So it's it was a revolution and a well deserved Nobel Prize yep. to the yep. to all the people who were involved in in in, in identifying it, using deciding hey this will be a great biological marker and then developing it into all the you know polymorphic versions you know the yellow fluorescent protein yep. blue fluorescent protein amazing story yeah and in fact it's widely used in virology as a marker and tracer as well all different applications. There's no other way to watch a protein in a live cell. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, there's other chemical dyes, I suppose, you can cross. Yeah. <laughs> now, these are, these are non-invasive. You don't have to add any chemicals, right? You just put the gene in and you see it in real time. It's beautiful. The only, my only complaint is that it's a bit large. The gene for the, the fluorescent protein gene is a bit large and it screws up some viruses, makes them replicate poorly. Sure. So yeah. if, if there were smaller versions, that would be nice. You you can is there can you use a flag tag? Can you get a flag tag to fluoresce with those fancy uh You can, but they don't fluoresce, so you have to add an antibody, right? And that's, yeah, that's where the not, GFP is beautiful. You don't have to add anything. You just put your cells, live cells under the microscope, no staining, no fixing, and you can see it. And if you're not done, you put it back in the incubator and look at them again the next day. So there's the frontier, right, of biology. Yeah. Uh, it's to yep. be able to improve the the, the the quality of the data by making a smaller GFP or just, you know, five amino acids that fluoresce. Oh, that would be great. Because my viruses have small genomes, and when you put 120 amino acids extra, they don't like it. And it compromises their life so that you know you are no longer doing the experiment properly. Right. Yeah, we'll need the tricorder then. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Please, engineers out there, biomedical engineers, please make us a tricorder. Yeah. So, guys, let's do a couple of emails here. Sure. Um, Jeffrey writes, Masters of TWIV. That's a nice appellation. <laughs> Masters of TWIV. Very good. In episode 47, you mentioned a class of viruses whose envelope unzips to release its genetic material. You also mentioned that this unzipping can be induced outside a cell by adding the proper chemical trigger. Has this mechanism been looked at into as a possible antiviral pathway? It seems to me that if you could flood a body with an efficient and fairly specific chemical slash enzyme trigger, then you could get most of the extracellular viruses to discharge into intracellular areas where the genetic material would be ineffective and rapidly degraded. So he's, we talked about viruses like polio where you can take the purified receptor and add it to the virus and it will pop the RNA out of the capsid. So he's asking whether you could make a chemical. And I would think, yes, you could design a small molecule, right, that would go into the receptor binding site and undo the uh, the capsid. It's a good idea. I don't know of anyone who is uh, working on that, but I don't see why you couldn't do a small molecule screen for uncoding molecules, right, Alan? You could. I think a lot of um, a lot of the drug development efforts have kind of soured on those types of approaches, the, um, uh, the receptor saturation approaches and the, uh, um, you know, triggered on coding approaches because you always get escape mutants and yeah. in the next generation, yeah. the virus just grows out those escape mutants. And sure. it, it turns out that viruses are sufficiently adaptable that they're not particularly handicapped by this. Yeah. Um, yeah. so this is what happened with the, one of the very first antiviral efforts against HIV was to just, uh, flood a bunch of CD4 in and the thinking was, oh, well, We'll, we'll saturate all the binding sites on the virus so it can't bind to the CD4 positive cells because that's the receptor. And of course, um, you got escape mutants, which could then bind, you yeah, know, at a different yeah. affinity to the receptor and they still got into the cells. Yeah, resistance is a problem. Um, so that's, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Um, it's futile. It's futile. Resistance yes. is futile. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good idea. Um, yeah. There might be a point. If you had, num if you had multiple such compounds, Yes, if you could get some kind of synergy going on yeah. with a compound that does this and then something else that um, you know stops a subsequent uncoding mechanism if you if you hit it at multiple levels simultaneously, right. that might work. He also asks, 
Episode 48 had me thinking about the question of vaccines administered after infection, like rabies. I'm wondering if for viruses which cause slower or chronic infections, could you slow the infection further by administration of antivirals and give the body enough time to generate an appropriate immune response? You would have to tailor this method for viruses which have a slow onset, are susceptible to antivirals, and whose vaccine is not self-replicating, but it might be a useful approach where exposure is known or suspected. Rules out a lot of viruses. Mm Mm-hmm. So they always have a balance to consider. If you give antivirals, you may, you know, inhibit the immune response so you don't get protection that you want. I don't know of any instances where this is being used. Perhaps in HIV infections, um, it's being tried to give antivirals earlier. The problem with anti with HIV, of course, is you don't get an appropriate immune response anyway, so that wouldn't help you. And many of the other chronic or slow infections um, aren't really suited to this. So it's a good idea, but I don't think um, it's something that is practical. Yeah. Yeah, two two excellent ideas, which unfortunately um, don't seem to work very well. James wrote, Dear Twiv, with regard to the ongoing discussion on whether viruses are alive or not, particularly in Twiv 59, I would recommend Schrodinger's What is Life? Although this short book was written before the structure of DNA was discovered, it is remarkably insightful and relevant. In particular, Schrodinger stated that life is, among other things, highly ordered matter that evades the decay to equilibrium with its surroundings by feeding on sources of order, which he called negative entropy. For humans, this can be, for example, in the form of sugars. This is a subtle argument because of the connection between entropy and energy in metabolism. I would say that a virus fits Schrodinger's definition of life because it parasitically uses the low entropy system of its host to maintain its low entropy state, most notably of its genome. I would also add that humans do something similar, albeit indirectly, by ingesting plant and animal matter. Of course, this isn't a perfect definition, especially because of things like transposons, as Professor Condit pointed out. Hope you find Schrodinger as thought-provoking as I did. Keep up the great work. Any of you guys read uh, What is Life? I have not. No. (laughs) Sounds interesting, though. I have a copy, which is from college. I bought it in college, and I never read it, though. It was a bit difficult then. So I I pulled it out, uh, Aunt James, and I will read it to see um, what this is all about. Because uh, admittedly, I don't understand a lot of this argument. <laughs> is is this like an uh, economics where you know half the virologists think one thing and half the other? Absolutely. Yes. I yes. had we had you on with uh, Peter Palazzi. Yeah. And I, I asked you guys, "Is a virus alive?" And I think he said yes, and you said no. That's about the, the split. We, <laughs> Mark, we put up a poll. Uh, we did an episode recently on about this, and we had an argument. So we put up a poll: Are viruses living? Yes, no. Maybe. And it's split all three ways, evenly. Well, I have a question for you. Sure. Did, did viruses, do they appear as, you know, genetic elements that then develop, you know, like a, a, a transposon, for example, just a single piece of jumping DNA that evolves into something more complex that has a coat and then improves its, 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 its transfer of genetic information? Or is it an organism that goes through devolution, like uh, reverse evolution down to or evolution into the simplest form, the basic you know, elements of life? That's a damn fine question. I think it evolves into whatever is needed to survive at the moment. But how about the first one? I'm, I'm asking where the chicken. Well, I, think but I, yeah, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think from the evidence that we have available that we can tell which direction it's going. Because you can, you can find um, even transitional forms where you've got a transposon that produces some capsid-like particles and... Well, which came first? Um, and I, I, I don't know, Vince. Have you seen any data that would that would suggest a direction for this? No, I don't think there is. I, I think if we assume it get it's getting more complex or less, it's probably wrong. It's whatever it needs to survive. But I suspect that the original viruses were probably just genomes, very simple genomes mm-hmm. that could replicate, maybe even pre- in precellular uh, organic soups. So from the RNA world. Yeah, that could be. I mean, obviously, we don't have any way to prove it, but in theory, 
we know at least one R one RNA virus, if you take its RNA genome and put it into a cell extract, it will replicate and make particles. So I think theoretically you could have a, a small, simple RNA doing that. And there's no obvious reason why you couldn't have multiple events of viruses arising. Sure. So you could have, sure. it could be both things. There could be some viruses that came from genomes and some viruses that came from uh, proteins and some viruses that, uh, um, you know, are devolving back into genomes and they, they could all have different origins. Yeah. And I, I also think that, you know, when cell, cellular life evolved, then the viruses need to evolve capsids so that they could enter those cells. And right. that's what capsids allow you to do. So they could exist for a long time just as a naked RNA, but when things change, they change too. You know, so my I try to avoid these uh, trajectory pre predictions where you say you're evolving towards something better because I don't think that's the way to look at. it. I think it's just whatever the virus needs to survive, if it may be for that minute or sure ten minutes, right? Stephen I, Jay Gould explained that quite well, I think. Yes, yes, exactly. I'm, Evolution I'm has nothing to do with perfection. Right. Perfect. Beautiful. Said it said much better than I could. <laughs> I'm thinking that if you could answer that question, right, it, that would sort of give you an idea. Well, if it was once living, and eh, I, I'd, you know, say perhaps it's still alive. Yeah. It, or is it, you know, these genomes that infect, or these little genomes that infect humans, for example, or the human community, aren't they just a greater part of the, or a part of the greater human genome, communi community genome? Uh, you know, yeah, and they're just human. Yes. They're just human. They're not really independent from us because they can't live without us. So they're just part of the human genome. And if the human community genome is alive, well, then they're alive, right? Mm -hmm. But not, not, eh, they go on for a kind of big circle. <laughs> it is an interesting, we've done it, believe me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we will keep doing it. Absolutely. Our, it's always fun. I love it. And, and <laughs> listeners get engaged too. And then they end up commenting on the discussion. It's a lot of fun. Especially over good ale, you know. <laughs> exactly. That helps. I just want a time machine to be able to go back, take some samples, and come back and sequence them. Oh, it's man, not much to ask for. Yeah, I know. All we want is the tricorder and the time machine. It it's reminds me of this movie, Avatar. Uh, have you guys seen that? Yes. Yeah, that was fun. Uh, the scientist Sigourney Weaver plays. She's always, I need a sample. I need a sample. <laughs> and it's right. Regret. <laughs> That's what it's all about. We need a sample. Okay, Lucky Fractal writes... Hello, profs. I've been thoroughly enjoying your podcast, even just as a layman, background in IT, but really like learning science. Viruses have always been fascinating to me, and my understanding has increased enormously simply by listening to your podcast and reading the links in the show notes. You're all great communicators and have an obvious passion for your work. The science world needs to be more accessible, visible to the public, so more people can increase their overall science awareness. And TWIV does an excellent job in this regards, IMHO. I find the odd bit of humor helps too. Sometimes I have to rewind the podcast after Alan's jokes as I'm laughing or groaning so hard I miss the other comments. <laughs> there you go, Alan. Thank you. You might like this clip from a science comedian that features some virus-related jokes. So he sent us a link to uh, one of these science comedians who uh, tells jokes like, you know, two viruses walked into a bar, that sort of thing. It's, it's a YouTube thing. Check it out. If I could also fit in a question. This article uh, mentions that regulation of cellular zinc balance can protect against papillomaviruses. I noticed that your blog mentions that rhinovirus replication can be inhibited by zinc. What are the properties of zinc that seem to have these effects on viruses? Thanks for all your efforts with the podcast. Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, zinc likes to bind protein, right? There are lots of uh, regulatory proteins with what we call zinc fingers, uh, motifs that bind zinc, and they're often required for activity of the protein, like transcription proteins need to have zinc. And I think that papilloma story is a matter of the zinc um, altering transcription protein activity that is needed for viral replication. I don't know why zinc inhibits rhinoviruses. We're, we're actually working on that. We don't know what the target is, and I, and I think if we knew the target of zinc, We'd know. So it's the sort receptor of, maybe? So there is some suggestion that the receptor is involved, yes. Um, but there's also a suggestion that something is getting in the cell and doing something inside. Mm. So I'm trying to make mutants that are resistant to zinc, which might identify the target of that salt. Do you know anything about zinc in proteins, Mark? 
Not really. It, all I know <laughs> is that it sticks to them. It sticks to them. It's positively charged. Zinc fingers. Uh, it's a domain that's common yep. yeah. uh, throughout the genome and allows for binding there. Yeah. And I so guess I, it's kind of like phosphorylation, right? It's yeah. I mean, you need zinc for certain the activity of these kinds of proteins, so you can regulate their activity by regulating zinc. Zinc doesn't get into cells very readily. You have to let it get in, either add a lot to cells, which is toxic, or let it get in by making pores in the membrane. So the, the biological amount of zinc is very low, but what is in there is needed. So it's a very interesting compound. I, I don't know a lot about either, but I think I'm learning, and uh, keep you posted. How heavy is zinc? What's the, what's the molecular weight? Depends on how much you have. Oh, the molecular weight. <laughs> yeah. Alan... We should know this periodic chart. Periodic chart. Yeah, I'm just, I'm <laughs> it, just I googling know. it up. Yeah, um, we'll Google it. I don't like their weight is sixty five point four. Right. So right. if it's big enough, I guess it could cause an allosteric change in the protein that's sure. binding. Sure. Sure. But you know, the zinc fingers have a four coordinate. They coordinate a zinc with four interactions with the amino acids. I believe it's mm -hmm. quite interesting. Yeah. Pam writes, I wanted to thank you guys again for making such a great podcast. It is really helping to refresh my virology knowledge, which is critical now that I am doing a translational project on herpes simplex for my KO8. So for all of you who don't know what a KO8 is, it's an NIH grant given to uh, clinicians to do some basic research. I think that's right. I was a sponsor of someone. You usually have a basic scientist sponsoring a clinician to do some basic research. So... Pam is actually a uh, MD-PhD at NYU School of Medicine here in the city. Just in case you guys haven't seen it, <clears throat> excuse me, our clinical fellow just forwarded me this notice about Curtis Cost's upcoming talk against vaccines. She apparently got it from a vegetarian group that she belongs to, Scary. She sent us a uh, poster. So I don't know who Curtis Cost is, but he's, he wrote a book called Vaccines Are Dangerous, A Warning to the Global Community. Wow, he's killing people, this guy. He's killing people. Yeah. So he was giving a talk here in the city. This was back in December. I don't understand why people do this. Um, because it's obvious that vaccines are not dangerous and most of the time and that they protect you. Well, the ones that are FDA approved have been through the testing for safety. They right? It's, it's so hard to get past FDA. So, so this guy is literally just preying on the fear that people have had yeah. getting a needle, right? And it sells books. So as yeah. long as it will make some money, uh, you'll have this kind of stuff. Yeah, and you see the picture of the book cover. Um, the uh, the skull and the wings of death are on on this prominent needle um, yeah. icon. So yes, I, I think, Mark, you just hit it right on the head. New book charges that the H1N1 emergency is a hoax and that vaccines for H1 are extremely dangerous. Well, we know that that is all false because they're not dangerous. It's not a hoax. 50 million people in the U.S. were infected. As far as I can tell, it's not a hoax. I, I got the vaccine. It was, yeah, I did it was as fun. Well. It was a fun day. The whole, we went the whole family, right? <laughs> great. That's great. Yeah, sure. By the way, back on one of the very early TWIVs when you were talking about adenoviruses, Vince said that you could see the adenoids when you look into the mouth. I have taken out hundreds of adenoids, so I wanted to correct that statement. The lymphoid tissue that you see when you look into the mouth is the tonsils, more precisely the palatine tonsils. The adenoids are located in the nasopharynx. You can't see them through the mouth without a special curved mirror instrument because they are hidden by the soft palate. The adenoids, tonsils, and lymphoid tissue around the base of the tongue make up Waldeyer's ring, which doesn't serve much of a function in modern humans other than being a site of infection. The crypts in the tissues can trap bacteria and probably viruses as well. We remove them to treat recurrent tonsillitis along with a tonsillectomy when the adenoids are large to treat sleep apnea in children, again, along with a tonsillectomy, and to treat recurrent otitis media ear infections in children if they persist despite a first round of ear tubes. Sorry to be pedantic about the site of the adenoids, but in this litigious society, if people get the wrong idea, they might sue if they think that their child's adenoids hadn't been removed because they still see palatine tonsils. Thanks again for the great show. Well, I shouldn't be talking about anatomy for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry I made that mistake. And thanks a lot for the correction. Yeah. Um, this is That's a testament, right. by the way, to the quality of the listeners that you've got. These are very, very smart people. This is yeah. a 
assistant professor of uh, otolaryngology. This is fabulous. The range of people. <laughs> we have people who are IT people, physicians, students, who just want to learn about viruses. I think we're very lucky. And, and it's great because we can talk off the cuff and trust that no matter what subject we're talking about, if we get it wrong, somebody will correct us. That's right. No, that's Absolutely. a great thing. These are very self-correct. That's one thing you don't do, Mark. You don't do, uh, in fact, none of the Twit podcasts do email from listeners. And I think you're missing out because it's really great. Yeah, we, we, I don't, I get maybe about three or four a week and they're all suggestions for guests. And you know what? They, they're fantastic suggestions. And for example, at 3.30 today, we're going to have um, uh, David Hosler who is one of the pioneers of the Human Genome Project and who's doing the, you know. Anyhow, great guests, uh, but that's, that's the kind of email I get. Yeah. Hey, I love the show. Um, he, he, here's a potential idea for a show. Yeah, well, uh, if, you really said, uh, if you said, look, send in your questions, we'll answer them. We, we you know, do, you that, do that, and there's a place for it, but it's the guest, because I guess the format where I have a guest yeah, sure. who exactly. asks all the questions, they, they, they realize that I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> and then that's... the guest is, ba is not back the next week, so you can't really have them answer the email. So yeah, yes, but um, we're, we're, we're lucky. I like this format. It is excellent. Anyway, let's, let's do some picks of the week and, uh, and wrap this up. Um, let's let you go first, Mark, since you're our guest. What have you got? So um, my pick for the week is not a really a, something physical, but it's a it's a place, and or it's an organization called the Association of Science and Technology Centers. So you can Google this Association of Science and Technology Centers. They have what you call a, they call it a passport program, the ASTC passport program. So I joined the uh, the Cleveland, um, you know, the Great Lakes Science Center, and the, what what was really cool the membership costs eighty five dollars for the whole family. And that means you can go unlimited time amount of times throughout the year. And we go maybe once every two months and we spend the day there when it's a rainy day. And there's always things to do. And it usually takes uh, at least a half a day uh, if we've been there before, a whole day if it's a, a science center that we've never seen. And what, what's neat, though, is that membership gives us access to over 290 uh, other science centers in over a dozen countries. So we've taken it to the Toronto Science Center. We've taken it to the Children's Museum in Pittsburgh. We plan weekend trips based on the 290 science uh, centers. And they're not all, you know, hardcore science centers. Some, the, we went to the Corning Museum in, in New York, which was fascinating. It was awesome to see pieces of glass and, that had been made 5,000 years ago and, uh, you know, how they make glass. And, you know, so uh, my pick is... Uh, go down to your uh, local science center, science museum, and ask them about the uh, passport program because it could mean that you'll be spending, every city you go to, you could spend a day with your kids uh, exploring fantastic museums for free. Now, there's two caveats. One, if you get the pass, like we have the Cleveland, uh, the Great Lakes Science Center pass, it, um, it doesn't allow us to go to any museums that are within, within 90 miles of our house. So it allows us to go to Toledo, to Detroit, to Pittsburgh, to Chicago, to Boston, New York, you know. And, and there's a, I mean, there's, there's six museums in, in Chicago that are all on the passport program. So we can go to Chicago, spend three days there for free, and just pay for meals and, and get, you know, get a, a cheap motel, you know, at Best Western for like 80, 90 bucks for the family and, and have a really, really great time. So my, my pick is the Association of Science Technology Centers passport program and you can find out about it at your local science museum and i just did a few quick searches on their site and i determined that uh i, I think all of my favorite science museums are listed so yeah that looks like a great deal we yeah. went to toronto the ontario science center it was free it's in canada you know you can go to uh um let's see this is really fun this this thing uh panama singapore sweden trinidad united kingdom mexico malaysia israel Colombia, mm -hmm. australia bermuda brunei <laughs> it's cool. Yeah, the, the European ones have uh, really nice museums. <laughs> I don't. I don't, I'm, I don't see any European ones. Too here. bad. Oh, UK. UK is here. Yeah. 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 Those. I love science museums. I love criticizing the science, especially <laughs> <laughs> the part that I know. We have one here in New York called the Liberty Science Center. It's um, it's actually right next to the Statue of Liberty. Mm -hmm. It's over in Jersey. It's pretty good. They just. Uh, have some errors in the viruses section. I always like to point out. We we did some Cub Scout overnights at the Science Center. You sleep right in there, and uh, I have all the guys. And hey, guys, I'll show you what's wrong with this. <laughs> so I can be obnoxious in that way. But That's I, okay. I do like Science Centers. I think it's great, and I wish people would go to them more. And uh, 
the one in Boston is a Boston's un- a good one. Yes, un- un- unbelievable, and and the shows that they put on. Yeah. Uh, the one in Liberty Science Center is on the list, by the way. There's one and in D.C., so is the, right? uh, the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, which was one of my favorites. Does the Koshland in D.C. count? The Marion Koshland Science Center? Let me take a look. Just pull it up here. There, uh, we, maybe we could put the PDF of the list. Yeah, uh, we will. Yeah, just link to the PDF. Uh, but I don't know. We're, we're looking at D.C. That's D is before M. <laughs> <laughs> it is, so, yeah. I, uh, I've got Delaware, well, uh, District of Columbia. I can't see it. Um, so I, yeah. But you know the one the, the museums in D.C. for the most part are free, right? Yeah, yeah. the Smithsonian's are all free. I think the Koshland is not, but uh, it's very good. Hey, that's great. Thanks a lot. Okay. What have you got, Alan? I have Zooniverse. Um, this is uh, the the home of Galaxy Zoo, and um, there are a couple of other projects there. Galaxy Zoo is the most advanced, but <clears throat> the way this site works is. Um, in recent years, astronomers have been doing what we in biology would call high throughput screening. Um, they've had these uh, automated telescopes set up just scanning the sky. And of course, they capture millions and millions of images, um, and then they have to analyze them. And one of the things that they're doing is classifying the galaxies that they see, because there are millions of galaxies out there. Um, It turns out this is a very hard thing to do by computer, so it needs to be done by a human. But there aren't enough human astronomers to sit around and categorize all these things. (laughs) So they put it online. And there's um, what you do on this site is you you join. It's it's totally free. Um, You you join this thing, and there's a brief uh, training program that shows the types of questions they'll be asking you. And what they'll what they'll do is they'll put up a picture of one of these galaxies from their telescope scan, and they'll say, you know, is it round or is it elongated? Does it have a bright center or does it not have a defined center? It just asks you a bunch of questions. Um, And then once you've got the feel for it, you go and you just start categorizing galaxies. Hmm. Um, And there are I think they now have a quarter million people participating in this. They've classified something like 53 million galaxies. Wow. And um, it's just a really, really cool approach to this kind of science. And uh, you can do it from your desktop. It's the social mediaization of astronomy, right? Exactly. It's cool. I love it. We should do this for virology. Yeah. I think biologists should definitely look into this because they've got a similar glut of data from all these high throughput projects. Well, it's crowdsourcing, right? You make a yeah, make sourcing, app right? Yeah, all you all you have to do is you need you need an experimental issue or or assay that can be reduced to something that a that a lay person can understand, and I think most things can be. Yeah. Um, and then you would you know structure it so that you've got error checking in there, and you you would have multiple people checking each result. Um, but uh, you know, quarter million people doing that. Uh, obviously, the staff yeah. is there. Yeah, a lot of the things we do, microarray data, sequence analysis, you can do that by computer, but there must be something that we need people to do. Yeah. Sure. Well, the human brain's a great processor, and it becomes easy to do. Yeah. You just, you yeah. Sometimes just get a lot of people to do it, right? A quarter million yep. people. Right. Do <laughs> go, They can go through a billion uh, galaxies fairly quickly. Yep. Yeah. Cool. I love it. Astronomy. Okay, my pick of the week is a website here at Columbia. We have a School of Health, which is part of the medical center. It's called the Mailman School of Health, School of Public Health. And they have wonderful talks here, and they record them, audio and video. For example, just yesterday, they had a symposium called The Science of Malaria Prevention. And they had four speakers, including Jeffrey Sachs, Richard Axel, and Wafa El Sadr, who are all famous people in malaria. And uh, and you may say, why is Richard Axel involved in malaria? Well, he's trying to get mosquitoes not to be able to smell you. As you know, he cloned this, the uh, scent receptors right. years ago. So anyway, it's a great resource, multimedia, and they have archives of all the past talks as well. Nice place to go and learn about things if you can't be in New York and listen to these lectures. Very cool. It's amazing what kind of education you can get online. Right? You can just sit in front of your computer and get really smart. Yeah, talk to or listen to a Nobel Prize winner talk about his work. Yeah, but get up occasionally so you don't also get really fat. Uh, Mark will tell or, you about that, right? DVTs, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh it, yes, electronic thrombosis it can kill you. Yep, wiggle your toes every hour. Get up. 
Well, that should do it for another TWIV. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. Glad that you didn't have to run off. You still have yes. a, you have an interview coming up at three now Eastern time. Uh, now I have one coming up at two forty five, and then one at four. So I do have a busy day. <laughs> yes, I'm interviewing some uh, PhD applicants now. So ah, we are all interviewing. Mark, thanks for coming back. It was a pleasure. It's it's, it's always an honor to talk science. Yeah. I love having you on. You yeah. ask great <laughs> questions. You're interested in. So today you're doing a futures in biotech. On the guy from with the guy who, who did the genome sequence. Well, he he was the first to see the entire genome sequence assembled. Ah. So he wrote the code that assembled the four hundred thousand contigs uh, that were sequenced uh, around the world. So it was on his computer that he uploaded it into the database so that the world could see the human genome in one piece. And cool. He's, He's doing some fun stuff right now. Well, the cool thing about Futures in Biotech is that it's it's live streamed as it's being done, and you can see the video as well. <laughs> That's scary. It's just it just gives me the <laughs> EBG. Now, is that going on iTunes eventually? Uh, the video will be posted on iTunes. They're sort of building up the workflow and hiring people to handle the larger workflow of editing video. I mean, they edit the video and then it becomes an audio podcast. Um, so they just extract right. the, the audio off of Final Cut. So it's it, the video is there, yeah. But there's so much work, and there's like you know four people doing the technical stuff, right? Cool. Um, producing twenty shows, about amazing. That's good stuff. I love it. So you do it once a month. Well, we did three in December, and we're doing one this month in January, mm -hmm. and then we'll do, uh, two for the rest of the year. Great. We're gonna have Susan Linquist on. We're gonna have Carla Kierkegaard, who's the chair of immunology at uh, Stanford. Uh, we're gonna have George Church to talk about the Personal Genome Project in February. Mm -hmm. He's going to do uh, Leo's genome. <laughs> so it, it's going to be... Uh, so you're having Kandel back too, right? Yeah, Kandel with Susan Lindquist to assist him. Oh, that'd be great. Kandel is... Yeah, he, he's, making, he's making mice genetically engineered to be smarter. How, how can you beat that? That's, I need that. <laughs> it's ultimate. It's great. Futures in Biotech, twit.tv slash FIB. It's a great podcast. Check it out. And if uh, this is your first time listening to TWIV, please subscribe. You can do it on iTunes. You can do it on the Zoom Marketplace. Uh, it helps us get to the front page and stay there so that more people see us. And that's our goal is to teach as many people as we can all about viruses. And if you want to see, by the way, sorry to interrupt. No, no problem. If you want to see Vincent... Uh, what he looks like, mm -hmm. tune in on March 19th at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 12.30 Pacific, and you're going to be participating in that show. You're co-hosting. You help co-produce yep. the show. With Carla Kierkegaard. That'll March, be fun. Friday, March 19th at 3.30. Yep. TWIV is part of microbeworld.org, sciencepodcasters.org, and promednetwork.com. If you like science podcasts and other resources check out those sites you can find it there and don't forget to check out twip our new podcast this week in parasitism at microbeworld.org slash twip and i think we'll have a new episode up next week as always send us your questions and comments twiv at twiv.tv you've been listening to this week in virology a podcast all about viruses thanks for listening everyone we really do appreciate it we'll be back next week another twiv is viral. <laughs>